I therefore hope that my lecture tonight, which by the way is quite long, will contribute, in spite of the chronic jet lag of the speaker, to the larger debate around the salient subjects of violence, war, migration, and sexuality, a debate I know the center and this university have been invested in by giving credence to a variety of approaches that engage with major social and political issues that affect the world in and around us. What you are going to hear tonight is a work in progress, one that examines the Syrian refugee crisis in Lebanon and specifically considers how queer identified Syrians navigate an often hostile environment in and around the Lebanese capital, Beirut. Drawing on hospitality as a philosophical concept and on the sociological notion of the stranger, I would like to focus on dis discourses and aspirations these refugees express in terms of language, what happened, something. Anyway, somebody needs to, uh, but, but I just wanted to show you a couple of pictures in a minute. So I would like to focus, as I said, on discourses and aspirations these refugees express in terms of language and bodily practices in the face of what many experience as obstacles and limitations within the social fabric of the host country. These discourses and aspirations frequently amount to practices that engender immobility, but also sometimes new forms of mobility that in turn create zones of encounter for individuals with varying class, sectarian, and gender backgrounds. In addressing these emerging zones of encounter, I look at what I would like to call the limited or even precarious pluralism for many gay Syrian refugees in Beirut, and therefore what it actually has meant to be a gay Syrian refugees in Lebanon over the last seven years. In so doing, my discussion will zoom in ethnographically on the eastern Beiruti suburbs of Burj Hamoud and Sedl Baushriye, and briefly reflect on some of their transformations over the past century from an early settlement for survivors of the Armenian genocide, mostly in the case of Burj Hamoud, to a place of residence for many domestic workers hailing from South and Southeast Asia and Eastern Africa. Today, both of these urban districts are two of the principal settings in Lebanon where the complicated politics of what I call strange hospitality can best be assessed. There are different ways in which the war in Syria and the ensuing refugee crisis can be made sense of. When a crisis looms large on the global stage, the tendency is not only to conceive of the victims as a monolithic group whose members are often devoid of gender and sexuality, but also to focus on the immediacy of the catastrophic situation at hand, relegate to the background those that preceded it and ignore the specificities of the individual human experiences. While we focus on this current humanitarian crisis, the largest since World War II, it is worth remembering that refugee crises in the Middle East have been protracted in large scale. Territorial and demographic transformations in the region long predate the latest mass displacement. And since World War I, and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire have proceeded for about a century in fits and starts, from the Armenians in the early 1900s to the Palestinians, the Iraqis, the Kurds, the Sudanese, and now the Syrians, among others. How can we, and I'm also speaking as an anthropologist here, make sense of these transformations and their impact on those who are referred to as Syrian refugees, especially the ones who identify as queer. How can we make queerness matter 
especially in the context of issues habitually seen as less important. That is to say, issues associated with actively unimagined communities. The current conflict in Syria is often referred to as a civil war. However, what began as an internal conflict among those protesting peacefully the brutality of the Assad dictatorship quickly grew into the formation of armed groups variously backed by the Arab Gulf states, Turkey, France, and the US on the one hand, and Iran, the Lebanese Hezbollah, and Russia on the other. Almost since the inception of the conflict in 2011, these groups have been battling each other within the wider context of a globalized war. Exactly seven years into this war, and in fact, tomorrow, March 15th, 2018, the Syrian civil war will enter its eighth year. And given the time difference, actually, one could uh, say that uh, the so-called anniversary is happening right now as I speak, which is very unsettling uh, to me when I think about it. Anyhow, uh, many of these groups who fought on the ground have possessed a jihadist ideology, such as the notorious Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, referred to as ISIS or ISIL in English, and as Daesh in Arabic, and its transnational army made up of fighters from numerous countries around the globe. Likewise, the globalized conflict has been represented as a sectarian war pinning a Sunni majority against an Alawi minority with the various denominations of Christian Syrians who are often portrayed as being passive followers of the regime in between. Yet defining the conflict as sectarian is to single out religious difference from among the many salient aspects of human identity of which gender and sexuality are but momentous parts of an ever so convoluted whole. Such a definition, that is to say, defining the conflict as sectarian, further assumes that identities are fixed and immutable, while in fact they are fluid and subject to perpetual inventions and reinventions in the face of the complexities of the world. One of the devastating outcomes in the conflict in Syria to uh, um, is, I mean, continues to be the outpouring on refugees. In 2015 alone, approximately 5,000 people fled Syria every day. Three years earlier in 2012, namely almost a year after the beginning of the uprising, Syria had a population inside as well as outside the country's borders estimated at around 22 million and a half. This number had dropped to an estimated population of 22 million in 2015. In early 2018, namely currently, the population inside, and I'm saying inside Syria, is being estimated at 18.2 million by the United Nations. And according to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the so-called UNHCR, the number of registered Syrian refugees today, namely today in March 2018, is about 5,605,231. While a minority of the refugees has traveled to Europe, most have fled to countries in the region. These figures put the number of registered re Syrian refugees in Jordan, for example, at 657,628, and slightly under 1 million in Lebanon. While there are ultimately no reliable numbers, and those we have are based on so-called registered individuals only, informed estimates advance that more than one-third of the current population in Lebanon, which is above 4.5 million approximately, and about one third is believed to be Syrian refugees. In Turkey, the total number of refugees as far as the UNHCR figures go 
is 3,547,194. Most important is a number that only a few anthropologists have been concerned with due to the lack of access, namely the number of so-called internally displaced persons, IDPs, which is 6.1 million. While almost 6 million people have fled Syria since 2011, seeking safety, as I said, in Lebanon, Turkey, Jordan, and beyond, 13.1 million individuals are in dire need inside the country, and amongst them are 3 million people in hard-to-reach and besieged areas. And based on these conservative figures, the total number of people internally uprooted and otherwise vitally affected in the wake of the Syrian conflict is more than 70% of the total population. And moreover, the current total death count, as you have already realized in Syria in the wake of the war, is estimated at well over half a million individuals. Well, there has been a substantial focus put on those individuals trying to reach Europe by crossing land and sea under terrifying circumstances, the refugee situation in Syria proper is barely investigated. The principal reason for this lack of research is the difficulty, if not to say impossibility, of access induced by the devastation and danger of the war itself. In Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, Iraq, Egypt, and North Africa, all areas where the overwhelming majority of refugees outside Syria is located, access has been a little easier, although this has greatly varied from one country to another. Moreover, the very nature of the refuge depends on, the, on a multiplicity of factors, including the state and social structure of the respective host, as well as the latter's particular sociopolitical position in the region. The war in Syria began at a time when I started a research project in neighboring Beirut, informed by the initial idea to write a historical monograph based on documents pertaining to a former hotel in Beirut. These documents shed a compelling light on the social and political history of the Lebanese capital, the country, and the wider region, starting in the mid-1950s, all the way to the first decade of the 21st century. And I will talk about it at length tomorrow at 10 a.m. during my research seminar on ethnographic and fictional writing. Yet after I started archiving the documents I had received during the summer of 2011, I quickly became consumed by the war raging next door. Having spent a lot of time in Damascus since the mid-1990s, I was sucked into the human devastation and I had no choice but to follow the plight of individuals with whom I had previously been acquainted. As a consequence, the growing refugee crisis literally imposed itself on me, not only as a subject of personal concern, but gradually also as a research topic. Thus, following Syrians to disparate places, such as Lebanon, for one, but also Europe and even South America, my project grew into something I had neither planned nor envisioned, but motivated by an almost paralyzed effort to address the current predicament and bring different topical, geographical, and disciplinary concerns together. As somebody who, for many years, had worked on queer identity formations in post-Civil War Lebanon, I quickly became interested in the role dissident genders and sexualities played among Syrian refugees, especially in the particularly harsh Beiruti context. Thus, I conducted fieldwork over several summers among gay and trans-identified individuals. Most of them had been persecuted to the, due to their sexual orientation, and some, but not all of them, for their political views. Following their daily lives, in and out of professional and intimate settings, I started by reconstructing the fallacies of the ordinary refugee experience, 
as manifest in and around two eastern neighborhoods of Beirut, notably that of, as I said, Burj Hamoud and Sed al Baushriye. And I might maybe use this by trying to zoom in here and show you more or less the place uh, uh, that I'm talking about. So, I mean, this is a regional, obviously, map. Uh, um, and then zooming into Lebanon, I mean, this relatively small country. I mean, first of all, I mean, you see, I mean, I opted for the geograph for the satellite version, uh, uh, which is a little bit better, I think. Uh, uh, but I can, of course, go back briefly to the political one. So you see the size of Lebanon, which is uh, uh, much smaller compared to uh, neighboring Syria. Um, to give you an idea, uh, uh, Damascus uh, uh, is about uh, two and a half hours away by car from Beirut. However, this is only due, I mean, would be actually much less, it is only due to the fact that you have to cross two mountain cha chains, so you Mount Lebanon, which is here, so you have to go drive all the way up and down to the Beqa Valley, which is this area, and then uh, you cross another mountain chain, which is the so-called anti Lebanon, which forms the border between Lebanon and Syria. And then you, you essentially drive down to Damascus, which, I mean, topographically, I mean, is or has been some sort of an oasis because further east starts the Syrian desert. And uh, uh, there is uh, an Arabic uh, word that uh, uh, some of you who might not speak Arabic have uh, 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 listened to, if you have listened to the news of, of late, as of late, and this is the so-called Eastern Ruta uh, of Damascus, which is essentially this area here where you have had uh, uh, all these massacres that made it to Western news uh, over the past few weeks. Uh, so back to Beirut. Uh, Beirut, which is essentially the city itself limited to uh, uh, what looks like a peninsula. However, the areas that interest me are located just outside of the city limits, uh, which is essentially here. I mean, this would be the city limit. Uh, uh, this is the neighborhood of Burj Hamoud, as I said, uh, a place where uh, 100 years ago, a little bit over 100 years ago, Burj Hamoud, uh, um, um, Armenian uh, uh, survivors of the genocide uh, settled. And then you have Sed al which is located here. And I will also show you a couple of pictures to give you a sense what I'm talking about. Okay, so, so this is, I mean, I will maybe comment them in a minute, but, but just to give you an idea, I mean, this is just a cafe where people are hanging out uh, but I'm, I'm also talking about this uh, multi-cultural, uh, multi-ethnic space uh, uh, that also attracts, especially on Sundays, uh, as I will mention in a minute, uh, um, uh, mostly domestic, female domestic uh, uh, laborers uh, hailing, in this particular case, from uh, uh, Ethiopia, but also from South as well as Southeast Asia. And I will continue. And so, so this is essentially how that streetscape on uh, Sundays uh, 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 looks like. And what is very interesting is uh, um, the uh, um, erotic dimension of it all, in the sense that this is a, a, a time where uh, many people uh, congregate and flirt and go out and actually do meet. And so you see uh, uh, these men in the foreground are, for the most part, Syrian refugees. And uh, in the background, you have uh, um, uh, um, Ethiopian as well as uh, uh, South and Southeast Asian women, for the most part. Uh, so, so, and here, I mean, you see uh, uh, a store uh, with, uh, I mean, you will recognize that this is not Arabic, but Sinhala, uh, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, uh, um, and that justifies, uh, that gives you an idea about uh, that multiplicity. And then here are, are, you see uh, uh, Syrian refugees uh, uh, um, selling and buying stuff uh, that uh, may uh, look to the uninitiated eye as garbage. And um, if you uh, look closely, I mean, you will see uh, uh, there is this uh, little tarp here by the UNHCR, which uh, uh, obviously comes from a refugee camp. Um, 
yeah, and, and, and this is a sign in Arabic that uh, uh, essentially says that uh, the municipality of uh, Burj Hamoud uh, uh, um, says to foreigners, uh, which is very interesting, I mean, this is actually the word for foreigner that is used here is a word that usually is uh, used to uh, refer to non-Arabs, mostly to Westerners, but it is used here nonetheless. And then you have in uh, parentheses the word Syrians. So they are essentially not allowed on the street uh, 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 between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. So uh, uh, and, and I uh, kind of like this picture because it has the Lebanese flag just below it and gives you uh, a sense of uh, what I'm problematizing in terms of strange hospitality that I'll get to in a minute. OK, so maybe. Uh, uh, I don't know, we'll just stick to this picture or that, and I will continue. While all of the refugees were officially registered with the UNHCR, some of these men, and I'm talking about the ones that uh, I, I uh, worked uh, with, sought and received political asylum in Western countries, mostly in Europe, but also in North and South America. Specifically, I have tracked the lives of a few individuals, one of whom I had met under entirely different circumstances in Syria more than a decade earlier. Sounds a little bit different, doesn't it? <laughs> in terms of the acoustics right now, I don't know what I did. Um, as they navigate the violent realities of refugees between Damascus, Dubai, and Beirut. I have been able to further follow this particular, especially one particular interlocutor of mine and some of his friends I met in Beirut, namely to the Netherlands where he received asylum. There is no room for me tonight to fully compare the data I collected since 2011 in Lebanon with some of the life histories of queer Syrian refugees I recorded in Western Europe by supplementing them with the ethnographic information on the Syrian diaspora in Argentina, which I have been working on separately during recent trips to Buenos Aires, and which I'll talk about tomorrow morning. But let me say that the South American country counts more than four million so-called citizens who claim Syro, what they call Syro Lebanese ancestry, most of whom follow, uh, uh, most of whom follow closely the events unfolding in the Middle East. It is moreover that community with active ties to the homeland that uh, has been the reason for some Syrians with family connections to uh, uh, um, to the southern cone to seek refuge across the South Atlantic. However, let me say that besides ethnographic interviews, my investigation is based in part on seemingly random day-to-day -day information of words and deeds and on formal interviews conducted with concerned individuals. While the material is a compelling illustration of the sayings and doings and thus of social life and identity formation under the duress of war and forced migration, a close scrutiny enables me to reconstruct a microcosm of a human laboratory where strangeness is met, strangeness is met with what I would like to call ambivalent hospitality and thus a precarious pluralism akin to the two Latin derivations, hospitality on the one hand and hostility on the other, where the foreigner, the hostis in Latin, is either welcomed over food mostly as a guest or treated as an enemy. Think here, for instance, Jacques Derrida's coining of host pitality, I mean a mixture combination of hostility and hospitality, but also the linguistic particularity in French where the word haut, it's like H-O with an accent circonflex, T-E, connotes not only the English host, but also its purported antonym, guest, thus binding and potentially confounding both. So you have one word 
that actually refer to, on the one hand, guest, and on the other hand, host. Yet what is included in this human laboratory, where strangeness is met with precarious pluralism, ranges from calculated attempts of inclusion, that is to say hospitality, to outright policies of discrimination, as you just saw, that is to say hostility, leading to precariousness and thus an imposed and sustained vulnerability. A central intervention here is not only to show that notions of bare life and states of exception are less conclusive than a concerned effort to understand a more tangible politics of precarity, but also to demonstrate how a queering of identity within that vulnerable precarity interrupts conventional descriptions of sectarian identity and the refugee experience that tend to perpetuate stereotypes rather than explain and contextualize the social complexity on the ground. Therefore, I situate the formations of dissident gender and sexual identities as a crucial locus to reconsidering conventional understandings of culture, society, and therefore the refugee experience. And in so doing, I provide here a multi-sided ethnography that plays close attention to patterns of violence that often expose bodies and ruins that are included, excuse me, that are induced by the experiences of forced migration. And these bodies and ruins are bodies of strangers where Georg Zimmer's sociological category can be twisted, if not to say queered, in order to demonstrate that they are neither the bodies of outsiders who have no specific relation to the city and to other, to the people and to the other people who inhabit it. Nor those of wanderers who come today and leave tomorrow. In fact, they may come today and stay tomorrow, if not to say that they have always already been there to begin with. Through life stories collected since the beginning of the hostilities in 2011, in varied places such as Damascus, Beirut, and then following those individuals to Berlin, Cologne, Rotterdam, and Buenos Aires, I craft ethnographic narratives and explore how queer Syrian refugees inhabit and perform their gender as they formulate the sense of identity in a variety of spatial and conceptual settings. This approach provides me with a critical standpoint from which to deepen our understanding of sexuality, gender rights, and citizenship in the structuring of social inequality in the wake of the war. I spent the last summers, the last roughly five summers, in Europe and South America observing the various debates surrounding migration and the refugees in France, for instance, the Netherlands, Germany, and Argentina. While in France, the number the numbers have initially been relatively small, approximately 10,000 during uh, the first five years of the war. Syrian refugees have for the most part been well connected and able to plug themselves into an already established local infrastructure that includes a sizable Syrian diaspora dominated by intellectuals. In Germany, however, the situation is unprecedented with over a million individuals that have arrived around the fateful fall of 2015 when the government decided to open its borders to them. While in the Netherlands, most refugees, at least the early ones, were harshly vetted before receiving asylum, those who left for countries such as Argentina were principally endowed with the necessary economic means to travel to South America on their own dime. As far as the situation in Lebanon is concerned, which many hope to be a transitory stop, but that has turned into the last one for most, there are no reliable numbers as to exactly how many Syrian refugees have since 2011 crossed the border westwards. My focus here is on the human and non-physical evidence of destruction and on what I call what I called just a minute ago, bodies and ruins induced by violence. 
This evidence points not only to the uncertainties of the refugee crisis, but also to the forms of mobility and immobility, the zones of encounter on the ground of ostensible refuge provide, specifically in terms of the language and bodily practices expressed by Gear Syrian refugees in Beirut, for instance. Thus interested in the daily experiences of queer identified men, I explore an ever so contested sense of being in the world, one that is ongoing, sometimes generative, but always slipping from the complete control of its protagonists. Using the uncontrolled and, un 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 and uncontrollable signifier of queer worldings under the duress of war, I follow the particular examples of self-identified queer Syrian refugees and reconstruct the fallacies of the ordinary refugee experience. And in so doing, I understand queer worldings under the duress of war to be mediators of differences in and out of intimate and oftentimes highly violent settings. I thus examine how within and without the context of the Lebanese capital, queer identified refugees contest and take on along literal and symbolic lines a hostile urban fabric of ever so hardened borders that are compelled ever so strange travelers to cross and navigate on a daily basis. Yet it is an urban fabric that in spite of all hostilities includes the subtle and overt manifestation of an intricate homoeroticism and as a result turns queer worldings into a manifestation of an assertive, all being at times precarious appropriation of the intimate as an expression of effective affinity. In other words, sex and sexual identity become strategies of survival but also resources that generate and sustain life and sometimes even love. So back to Beirut now. Beyond the surface of the city's hustle and bustle, the suburbs of Burj Hamoud and Sed al are two of the most, of the foremost zones that facilitate the initiation into a general kind of male homoerotic encounter. Located at the northeastern end of the Lebanese capital, Burj Hamoud and uh, is, I mean, Burj Hamoud uh, is a site extra muros where, as I said, Armenian refugees settled in the early 1900s. Throughout the 20th century, Burj Hamoud continued to attract a diversity of econ economically derived, deprived groups, including Christians from South Lebanon who fled the various outbursts of violence during the country's civil war, which lasted from 1975 to 1990. At the same time, many Syrians started calling the suburb home after the influx of labor migration at the end of the last century before the current war. This trend has only been confirmed since the beginning of the war in 2011. Moreover, the relatively new phenomenon as I have mentioned as well, of domestic workers hailing for the most part from South and Southeast Asia as well as East Africa has become part and parcel of Burj Hamoud's streetscape, primarily attracted by the comparatively cheap real estate. This phenomenon where race manifests itself within the global and transnational context of a Beiruti suburb becomes especially clear on Sunday afternoons when many of the workers have their part of the day off and use the free time to congregate in an area that over the past 10 years has witnessed the opening of Ethiopian and Sri Lankan grocery stores, beauty parlors, and call centers. Although more transient and less pedestrian friendly, Sed al located further east, shares some of the same characteristics, mostly as well due to the relatively inexpensive rents that attract an eclectic range of people. Here I would like to argue for the importance of place, that is to say, Burj Hamoud and Sed al 
and the suburbs' particular histories of liminality and transience in allowing for an appropriation and negotiation of space, of alterity, difficult to come by in other parts of Beirut or even Lebanon. To give further credence to my argument, I briefly shift my attention from the complex macrocosm of the suburb onto the microcosms of two small establishments, one in the middle of Burj Hamoud and the other one in Sedl Boshligi. The first one, located in the midst of dense urban housing, has been catering for almost 20 years to gay men. The second one was for a couple of years in an apartment building housing a local NGO that catered to queer-identified Syrian refugees and that closed in 2015 after accusations related to prostitution cut its funding that was coming from Western embassies. For a long time, the Shahrazad bathhouse operated as a venue in which men, for the most part Arab Lebanese, but not exclusively so, congregated and indulged in an overall homoerotic atmosphere that included the occasional covert sexual release, either through a fellow customer or through a purchased massage by one of the local Syrian bath assistants. Although open on a daily basis, the establishment was very popular on Sundays when parts of the streets surrounding it are teeming with migrant workers from Eritrea to the Philippines. An ethnographic description of the goings on in, at the Shahrazad bathhouse that focuses on spaces of intimacy and thus on the queer worldings of a Syrian refugee will be paired here with one of the NGO space and ultimately bring me back to my primary argument, namely that it is particular places and their sociopolitical configurations that can be the conduit for social realities to thrive whose various articulations would be easily contained elsewhere. However, it is necessary to address discourses surrounding racism the racialization of difference and why the queer worldings of the microcosm of the bathhouse never pay, plays host to the ethnic worldings of the streets macrocosm. In fact, the construction of race and racism in Lebanon needs to be understood within the larger context of the dire politics of inclusion and more so exclusion of certain individuals and groups. Within that politics, dissident queer sexualities do not necessarily carry any emancipatory promise. While race and sexuality are not co-evil, there are corresponding structures of violence in Lebanese society in which homophobia and racism run parallel. But there remains a qualitative difference in that the recipient of the former, that is to say gay men, can be an active component of the latter, that is to say, racism. Although I discovered the Shahrazad bathhouse in 2001, I returned several times over the years, and so it was that in late summer of 2014, I met Hani, a man in his late 40s and originally from the old city of Damascus. In spite of a lacking physical attraction, the two of us quickly engaged in a conversation which he had initiated. Seemingly apprehensive at first, Hani was one of those fellow bathers who tended to wait and see while sitting patiently on one of the tiled benches. In contrast to some of the other men present who were in the business of checking out closely everybody, that, everybody and everything literally that moved, Hani was a rather reserved fellow possibly enjoying the human scenery unfolding before him much more than actually partaking in it. However, despite his shyness, he approached me, wondering why I did not smoke in a place where the high consumption of cigarettes seemed to form an integral part of the progressing ritual of hot and humid courtship. After an hour or so of small talk in and out of the caldarium, 
I concluded that Hany was no ordinary man. Even though he seemed to lack formal education, his overall demeanor was highly eloquent. In addition, his politeness startled me quite a bit. Partly acknowledging the commotion unfolding around us, Hany told me that he had been living in the adjacent suburb of Sedl Bouchriye for about a year. Like countless others in and around Beirut, he was a Syrian refugee. And up until 2012, he operated a bakery in the old quarter of Damascus, he told me. However, there was not much information he divulged to me, probably also because he did not quite know what to make out of the person he was conversing with. It is only a year later, in the summer of 2015, when I managed to fill out some of the blanks in Hany's story. Coincidentally, he was the subject of desire of a Syrian friend of mine whom I had met under completely different circumstances some 12 years earlier. Mohammed was a young fashion designer who had graduated in 2002 from the Damascene branch of a French fashion school before moving to Dubai to work for one of his intimate friends, as he put it, with whom he would embark on a tumultuous relationship. Over the years, that relationship turned into a hellish concoction of blackmail and abuse, which led Mohammed to return to, Ma to Damascus in the summer of 2011, at the very beginning of the war. Because his former partner had informed Mohammed's family of his homosexuality, the latter was brutally beaten up by one of his brothers. This physical assault coincided with the height of the anti-regime demonstrations in the Midan district in Damascus, which led to the incarceration of some members of Muhammad's family. Apart from the physical torture they had to endure, the family in its entirety became the target of a whole range of threats by militia members supported of the Syrian regime. The mayhem outside and the homophobic violence inside resulted in Muhammad's flight to Beirut, where he took advantage of the situation to officially register with the UNHCR and thus seek political asylum in the West. While waiting for his case to be processed, he ran into an old acquaintance of his from Damascus, and that acquaintance was Hani. Mohammed and Hani had met shortly before the former moved to Dubai around 2005. Upon meeting in Hammam al-Jadid, one of Damascus's queer identified bathhouses, Mohammed fell in love with Hani, a sentiment that was not to be reciprocated. Yet they kept in touch throughout the years. When they serendipitously reconnected in Beirut in the wake of the Syrian civil war, Mohammed advised Hani on how to apply for asylum through the UNHCR, which he did. Mohammed took Hani to the NGO, which incidentally was located just a few streets down from where the latter had rented a room in Sedl Boshriye. There, Hani met with large numbers of other gay Syrians, some of whom he knew from before. They gathered regularly to receive and exchange vital information about any help they could garner. This included counseling sessions of different kinds, but also the opportunity to mingle informally during catered meals and after movie screenings. The NGO closed its door in 2015, after allegations of prostitution came up target, targeting its Lebanese director, who prior to the Syrian civil war ran a travel agency for Western gay tourists traveling the Levant. The allegations, which were partly conjured up by competing local NGOs, stopped the funding that so far was coming from uh, European, mostly actually the Dutch embassy. There is not enough space here to fully engage with the complicated politics of NGOs in Lebanon. The intimate rivalries among their leaders and the pernicious funding structure that makes a whole sector entirely dependent from politically motivated outside money. This topic, however, remains a crucial one. To return now to Hani and Muhammad, 
While the latter received political asylum in the Netherlands, in part thanks to his affiliation with the above-mentioned NGO, the former embarked on a long paperwork journey, having his application be moved from one office to the other over a period of almost three years. He was waiting for an official interview at the Canadian Embassy when I met him for the second time. At that point, he was willing to share with me a little more than the bits and pieces of information he had initially divulged in the Shahrazad bathhouse. From what I understood, Hani had been in a long-term relationship in Damascus with another man his age. However, he was also married to a woman with whom he had two children. Although his homosexuality had been the subject of many a problem over the years between him, his wife, and his family, things got exacerbated during the year following the popular uprising in 2011. Along with his longtime male lover, he took part in all the early anti-government demonstrations until both became the target of the regime. As a consequence, they fled like countless others to neighboring Lebanon. Hani's political escape coincided with his increasing difficulties of juggling his homosexuality with the conformities of his formal life. He went to Beirut to seek refuge from the immediacy of the war, but also to end what he called a schizophrenic life, or a hayat uh, mafsuma, as he put it in Arabic. But while he waited on an official response from the Canadian embassy, he lived precariously in Sedl Boshriye in a tiny room under the roof of one of the many nondescript and decrepit Beiruti high rises. And at the same time, he continued to be at the outlook for underpaid part time jobs. On one of my recent trips to Beirut, I mean, relatively recent, I mean, when he was still there in 2015, in October, I did not manage to see Hani for he was visiting a friend of his in the Lebanese mountains on the day we had planned to see each other. Nonetheless, he told me on the phone that his last interview with the Canadian consul was a success and that he was waiting for final approval before moving to Quebec by the end of the year. There is a large Arab community in Montreal, he told me, and I'm sure they're in need of a good baker. Two months later, I communicated with Mohammed the one who was in the Netherlands, who told me that thanks to the political reshuffle in Canada induced by the Liberal Party's takeover of Parliament, Hani had managed to move earlier to the St. Lawrence River than planned. Whatever might happen to him in Quebec's metropolis, his story indicates part of the difficult terrain that gay Syrian refugees in Lebanon navigate in coping with the harsh and violent realities on the ground. And this ground, I would like to argue, is part of an intimate queer worlding that is under perpetual social construction. Moreover, what Hani's story shows is how gay Syrian refugees like him make discursively sense of physical and mental space along with the complexities of its infrastructure and varying intimacies in an increasingly globalized world where the refugee experience has become a pivotal, pivotal one. As of last summer, it turns out that Hani actually made it to Toronto. As he told me on the phone when I called him on his Ontario number given to me by Mohammed, he was happy to live in a city that offered him regular work. Yet it was not a bakery in which he found employment, but in a temp agency that turned the uh, Khubz Arabi baker, I mean Arabic bread baker, into a seasonal construction worker. The manual labor was hard, Hani told me, but it was still better than the perpetual suspension and, ex and emergency he was living in before. Compared to Lebanon, Canada did not engender the constant fear and the economic precariousness he had experienced after leaving Damascus. Here, he dreaded the cold and the fact that his English was mediocre, but he sensed to be taken care of by a well-functioning welfare system, and most of all, he did not feel to be internally looked down upon. 
However, his long-term partner, with whom he had fled to Beirut, still waited anxiously in his tiny bleak room under the roof in Sedlboshriye for his papers that would finally enable him to join Hani. This changed only recently, actually, according to a phone conversation I had with Mohammed just two days ago. After a couple of years of being apart, the pair was reunited in suburban Toronto, and I have to follow up on the details. Some theoretical words at the end. Two more minutes. To anthropologists, mass displacement presents overlapping theoretical, applied, and political challenges. Every refugee situation provides a laboratory for experimenting with new ways of organizing space, delivering aid, managing host refugee relations, governing and managing the displaced, developing and testing new policies, and equally as important, albeit often ignored, and imperative to assess the individual pulse of time. Every refugee situation also compels an examination of lessons learned or what not to do. For example, Palestinian camps, many of which are located within Syria, and have been totally destroyed by the war, are often foremost in people's mind when they think of camps, refugees, and the long-term nature of displacement. Governments in the region are particularly wary of what is called Palestinization, that is, when a refugee situation becomes protracted with no end in sight and camps become permanent abodes. This is one of the reasons for why Syrian refugees are met with such hostility in Lebanon, although camp life as such and formal closure, as my description has shown, is not part of the daily realities in and around Beirut. For that particular reality of physically hardened borders, one must venture outside the capital city and into the hinterland of the Beqa Valley. Yet a key issue in any refugee crisis is the nature of these spaces and the techniques of containment along with those that act in response to it, not only in official refugee camps, but also in seemingly open urban areas that come with their own politics of confinement. A prime anthropological question remains here at the end. What new spatial devices and techniques, those that are formally closed but also those that are ostensibly open, will emerge to handle the continuing violence, displacement, and generalized precarity. While Syrian refugees will persist in crossing borders that are increasingly hardened, anthropologists need to ethnographically and historically capture the larger issues pertaining to migration, hospitality, alienation, and therefore precarity. We need to do this not only in the wake of today's death and destruction and by reminding ourselves of cross-cutting temporalities and, and the remapping physical and mental of the Middle East and Europe, but also by taking into account strange hospitalities and thus the complexity of individual biographies within the larger context of demographic and sociopolitical transformations our world is currently experiencing. Thank you.